Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wonder Goal, the soccer betting podcast from the Action Network. I am BJ Cunningham. Michael Leboff, your illustrious host, is out today. I am joined by our good friend Sam Ingram of Betting Expert. We'll be breaking down all 10 Premier League matches, take a little jaunt around Europe. And we're going to start with the headliner. Sunday, 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 4.30 p.m. over in the U.K. Liverpool hosts Chelsea in Liverpool's biggest game so far this season, their biggest test so far. Liverpool is a minus-143 home favorite. Chelsea sitting at plus-375 with the draw at 3-1. to one. Sam, this is a, an incredibly fascinating match because Chelsea has been playing very, very good under Maresca lately. We are coming off international break where a lot of players has been playing and traveling in from all over the world. We've been through this already once previously with Liverpool. And obviously they have, you know, players from many different nations, a lot coming from South, South America, from Africa. And coming off the international break, they suffered their first defeat of the season against Nottingham Forest. So could we see some tired legs again, potentially from Liverpool? Uh, or do you think that this is just going to be another Arnie slot victory to make it seven of eight to start the season. I would say so. Yeah. Tired minds, tired legs. Luckily for Liverpool, Chelsea will be feeling exactly the same. So they've got a lot of top class players for playing for a lot of nations in Europe and beyond. Um, Liverpool are obviously yet to play a team that finished in the top seven last season. So that is worth bearing in mind when you start to analyze the data surrounding Liverpool start uh, on his slot slots start to life on Merseyside. They opened around 1.85 ish in um, when they were released on Bet365. So I think that was the bet for me here. Now they're, they, they've, they've shortened a little bit. So I'm not over the moon with that price. But if you look elsewhere, you can get under 3.25 goes at minus 108. So I think that's interesting. Also a little scary because both sides have attacking ammunition in abundance. However, and we, we've touched on it a, a few times. This Arnie Slot team is is far more controlled than a Jurgen Klopp team. Um, there hasn't been one Premier League game that has ventured over 3.5 goes for Liverpool on the slot. It's all very calm and considered in comparison to what we've grown accustomed to at Anfield. And when you think of Chelsea, I think you'll instantly think of like the 6-2 away in Wolves, 3-0 against West Ham or the 4-2 at home to Brighton not too long ago. And I think that's fair enough, but you've got to question those respective defences they come up against there. All three, for me, highly suspect. But Anfield away from home, it's a different kind of test. Liverpool have conceded 5.17 XGA from seven games and no side boasts less than that. Although Chelsea, their 7.88 XGA isn't far behind. So although it might be the game of the weekend, I think I'm going to throw a little water on it because I don't think we'll see the high scoring affair that many people will instantly think of when looking at either lineup and the quality in, in forward areas. And like you said, if you add to the fact of all these players being away on international duty and coming back and having to get straight into this game, um, we, we might see uh, it to take a little while to, to take off um, in, in the Premier League this weekend. So under 3.25 at minus 108, I thought that was a pretty good way in. I agree. I'm going to be on three under three and a half here. I think the tactical battle is interesting here, Sam. I think you know, who's actually going to be able to control this match? Because obviously Chelsea under Maresca has controlled pretty much every single match outside of the one against Manchester City earlier this season. They have held under 50% possession against West Ham and Brighton, but they were also leading by multiple goals at the end of the first half. So you would expect them to concede possession, play a little bit more defensive. Um, Liverpool, their defensive setup is very similar to what Nottingham Forest played against Chelsea. They play a 4-2-4, and actually Chelsea plays the exact same formation defensively as well. And what that does, what Chelsea likes to do a lot, they'll set up in a 4-2 base to start, and they'll bring the goalkeeper out, and then once they get higher up the pitch, they'll move into a 3-2-5. But they utilize that 4-2 that base to get their fullbacks high and have those easy outlet balls for teams that will only press with two or three guys on the front line. But what Liverpool likes to do with the front four is they like to curve and make those angles and not allow those easy outlet balls. So Chelsea's probably most likely going to have to try to play through the middle here. And Liverpool 
is much better in terms of their ball winning in the middle of the pitch. So I think it's going to be very difficult for Chelsea to actually find a way and actually create chances. Liverpool, though, the control under slot has been amazing. From a 0-0 game state, they're only allowing 0.43 expected goals per 90 minutes. With a one-goal lead, they're only allowing 0.81 expected goals per 90 minutes. So I think what's fascinating is does Liverpool, because, you know, the one big game that they had, Sam, was against Manchester United, right? And how did they create most of their chances? They sat in that mid block. They forced high turnovers off of that, and they got those quick counterattacking opportunities, and they punished United over and over with that. They could do the same here against Chelsea, who's going to want to build out of the back. So that does give Liverpool a little bit of an advantage, but I'm with you. I, three and a half is high. I mean, no Liver, not only has no Liverpool game gone over three and a half goals, no Liverpool match has had over 3.1 expected goals created in it. So I think this total is, is, is a touch high. Uh, I have 3.06 goals projected for it. So anything under three and a half at minus 130 is good enough for me. But yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see who controls this match uh, from the start. All right, let's move on to the opening game out of the international break, 7.30 a.m. Eastern time over in the United States. Tottenham and West Ham meeting in a London derby. Tottenham is sitting at a minus 200 home favorite. West Ham sitting at plus 475 with a draw at 4-1. to one. I think we kind of see this game the same way, Sam. I think there's going to be a little bit of chaos here out of the international break. Even though, you know, we typically talk about these games coming out of the international break being typically slow, that's not really the case with either of these teams, is it? I don't think so. Um, Tottenham are a box office this season. Mm -hmm. No team in the top half has lost more matches than Spurs after seven games. They're averaging two goals per 90, but they've also conceded eight in seven games. We've just seen them race to a lead against Brighton before capitulating in the second half. We saw Spurs wipe the floor with Man United away from home. Um, so like I said, yeah, this is this is like Hollywood stuff. And going forward, they're brilliant at times. Super dynamic across the front line. Got Brennan Johnson. He's morphed into prime Spurs. Gareth Bale, he's scored in each of his last seven games. So there's, there's goals in this Spurs side. I don't think anyone can deny that. And here they come up against a West Ham team. That's quite similar in that respect, I think. Like from a general overview, they're like somewhat top heavy better in the opponent's box than they are defending their own defensively very very suspect to start the season under Lopetegui and that Chelsea defensive performance was one of the worst I've seen this season I'm, I'm a broken record I've said that a few times now on this podcast maybe the worst I've seen this season um so what happens when you get two sides willing to attack and hand the onus to the quality at the top end of the pitch I think there should be goals. I don't think we really need to overthink it. West Ham put four past Ipswich just before the break, which will do them the world of good. They needed that. And from the off, actually, watching the game, I thought West Ham were really quite good against Ipswich. They were assertive. They attacked Ipswich with intent, and that shone through in just how quickly they took the lead. It felt like the energy in that dressing room, for me, was very much along the lines of, but there's no way we're going to not win this game today. They, they, and they were really good value for that 4-1 when they kept going and going. And the caveat is it was Ipswich. You've got to bear that in mind. But I think it'll be more of the same. They're, they're suspect at the back, but going forward, Kudus, Bowen, Antonio um, got on the ghost. Paqueta, he's probably a level above West Ham. And yeah, I, the bookmakers agree that there might be goals. The goal line sat at over 3.5, under 3.5. But I think we can be somewhat confident that West Ham does enough to contribute. So both teams to score an over 2.5 goals at minus 137. I think, like you said, that that's a selection we're aligned on. We should see goals um, at the Tottenham Stadium. Yeah. And, you know, along those lines, I think it was kind of interesting to see how West Ham was creating their goals against Ipswich. Three of their goals came of the result of crosses. And what was interesting about the Tottenham and Brighton match is so Tottenham's the, the most aggressive pressing team uh, in the Premier League. They have the lowest passes per defensive action. They're fo forcing uh, the most uh, dangerous possession loss for their opponents so far. But doing that, if you can beat the first line of pressure because they're going man to man, Brighton essentially just said, "All right, well, if we're going to go one v one across all four of guys across their back line, like I like the." Ruder, Matoma, like that type of matchup against your opposing fullbacks. And they did that. 
and they punished Tot and they punished Tottenham in the second half by doing so. So, like you mentioned, if you're getting Bowen, Kudus, and Paqueta into one v ones against Tottenham defenders, I like West Ham's chances to get past them in terms of dribbling and actually creating chances off of crosses because Tottenham allowed two goals off of crosses against Brighton. So I think that's West Ham's method to scoring here. Obviously, they are a team that's trying to control matches more and trying to build out of the back. They're very vulnerable in terms of turning that possession over and giving Tottenham those easy transition opportunities. That's how Tottenham scored their first goal against Brighton. And like you said, West Ham's just a horrid defensive team. So I'm with you. Same exact selection. Both teams to score over two and a half. If you can get that under minus 150, I think there is a lot of value on that. All right. Let's move on to the... 10 a.m. Eastern time window. You know what? Michael's not here, Sam. But let's talk Everton. Ipswich hosting Everton. Ipswich is a favorite. Plus 137. Everton sitting at 2-1 to with the draw at plus 230. I'll do my song and dance and I'll do my rants. But this seems like a, a slam Everton spot here. Yeah, I thought you might have said that. And it, <laughs> you, you mentioned you mentioned it there. It's the dynamic of this game that like really grabs me. Ipswich are favourites to win in ninety minutes for the first time in the Premier League this season. They're not going to arrive on Saturday against a big, big Premier League team where they'll need to like sit in, work hard out of possession. They'll feel like they can really get at this Everton side, um, and so do the bookmakers, obviously by the pricing. But we can also be sure that Everton arrive at Portman Road um, and they've been performing well of late. You think they'd arrive and they'd really fancy their chances here to get three points. They're three games unbeaten. I would say they're unlucky to be on just the five points. The underlying data suggests that they're running at around five expected points, but I do think they're a little bit unlucky. We've seen a couple second half capitulations as well against Bournemouth and Villa. Um, where they were in the lead. So we know they've got that in their locker too. So what I've ended up on is over 2.5 goals at minus 114. I like that. Um, I I also like the Everton plus 0.25 Asian handicap, but I've sided in with goals because I do like Ipswich at Portman Road for goals. And I think if Ipswich really go for it, like they have done over the last couple of seasons, then they're going to make Everton flustered. I'm sure of that. They just need to be brave in possession which is easier said than done in the Premier League. They need to commit bodies forward and and prey on any loose change from that Everton backline. But after all, Everton have conceded 12.02 XGA from seven games. Ipswich tops that with 15.7 XG. Opt to have them as the worst team in this metric in the Premier League this season. And the reason we can get an over 2.5 goal line is because of the lowly XG at the other end. But luckily... Football's obviously not played on a spreadsheet and mm-hmm. I'm going to go against those numbered in fours areas at a decent enough price because something has to give two defensively really suspect teams and two teams not so good going forward. So over 2.5 goes at minus 114. That's why I've ended up. Well, if you've been listening to this podcast long enough, you'll know that me and Michael will be on Everton here. Uh, I don't, I don't understand why Everton is an underdog here. Because you mentioned Ipswich has the worst underlying metrics of anybody so far. And defensively, Sam, I don't really know what the plan is. Because in the championship, they were a high-pressing team. Although they did play mid-blocks in certain instances and and, and in certain matches. But right now, they're not an intense pressing team. They're 17th in pass per defensive action. They're trying to play a 4-2-4 mid-block. Um but their opponents have the tw- their dead last and build up completion percentage allowed. So opponents are just playing right through them. And I don't really understand what the plan is. If you watch that West Ham match, there were countless times. I know West Ham scored uh, three goals off the result of crosses. There were countless times that West Ham was just dribbling right up the middle of the pitch against them. So, and when you face Everton, well, you've got to be able to defend crosses. So Everton, obviously, that's how they play. They like to play very direct. They like to get the ball out wide, and they like to send in crosses over and over and over again. Uh, Everton, I think in this type of match, if Ipswich is, like you said, they're going to be at home, and they're going to think they can actually control the match. They haven't held over 50% possession in any match this season. I would bet that they actually do that in this one. 
Everton is po- forcing opponents into losing possession in dangerous areas at the third highest rate in the Premier League from their high block. They are very, very good and very difficult to play through. Where they've struggled is they can't defend crosses to save their lives. People have just been getting the ball wide and just swinging crosses in over and over against them. I'm not sure Ipswich is really the team to be able to exploit that. And you mentioned the offensive numbers, five expected goals in seven matches. Well, Liam Dillap has scored four goals off of 1.2 expected. So the best striker and their best attacking option hasn't really been able, has been overperforming pretty drastically. So I love Everton here. I think this is a slam spot in Everton. I think they should be favored here on the road. And when we talk Everton, we have to talk set pieces. Well, Ipswich is, is 14th and XG per set piece allowed. So I think it's a great spot here for Everton. I like them on the money line two to one, but draw no bet at plus 115, protecting myself against some type of collapse, uh, I think is a, a really good bet and one of the best on the board this weekend. All right, let's move on to, you know what? Let's move on to one of my one of my Super Bowls every single year. Manchester United taking on Brentford. Manchester United is a minus 143 home favorite. Brentford sitting at plus 350 with the draw at plus 320. Um, I said this is one of Sam. This is one of the matches that we love to bet Brentford in every single year. Um, one, I'll still say this to my one of the from from this podcast. One of the more greatest days that I've felt is when Brentford hammered United for nothing. I think it was the beginning yeah. of the twenty twenty two season. I want to say I think it was twenty twenty two. That game still reigns in my mind. It was one of the more uh, great games and that we've had on this podcast, but you know, Brentford have been, I know the results don't show it, but Brentford have been a thorn in Manchester United side over the years. Now I like the way you're going with this match because well, the Brentford matches have just been crazy so far. I mean, we had eight goals against wolves before the international break. So I see you're expecting goals in this one. Yeah. So this was actually one of three bets I put forward on the Bet and Expert podcast out of the whole European schedule. So this is one that I really like. And I've picked out a quote, which I mentioned on that podcast. Thomas Frank said after the Wolves game, in general, we want to get forward as quickly as possible. We want to work it on the side and put crosses into the box. And if you look at Nathan Collins's opening goal in the second minute versus Wolves, he kind of he stepped out of defence, forward with the ball from his usual position, popped it off to a midfielder and just carried on into the six-yard box. And he had a, an easy header from close range. And it's that movement from Nathan Collins that kind of shines a spotlight on exactly what Thomas Frank is asking for from this Brentford side. Set van der Berg did similar throughout the other central defender. And it kind of pulls players towards them and it leaves others in midfield unoccupied. And I feel that's going to cause United all sorts of problems on the weekend. And this is a United side which hasn't scored in the past three Premier League games. And now with United at home and with the expectation on them to win this game, um, I really struggle to see how they don't score. Like Eric Ten Hag's job is on the line here. They, they really need a result. If they blank in this game against Brentford, I'll be highly surprised. And um, yeah, I just feel like if Brentford make the opportunities, they make the most of their opportunities in transition and put that United defensive unit on the spin and, and running towards their own goal, then I'd really expect them to profit too. Um, and if you look at the the game before the international break, Brentford scored five goals in one game. Obviously, that's that's pretty impressive. And that's as many goals as United have scored all season. Um, which is somewhat amusing, but United have been under underperforming their XG by 6.11 XG. They've scored five from 11.11 XG. So that should revert at some point. And if you look at Mark Flecken in the Brent, Brentford goal, he's made the most saves of any goalkeeper in the Premier League this season, joint with Leicester City's Hermanson and 33 saves. So perhaps this is the week for United to find their shooting boots or come close to, to scoring a couple of goals at least. So yeah, I've gone for both teams to score an over 2.5 goals at minus 120. I like that. Um, I will be on Brentford. Uh, the price has come down here. I did grab a Brentford plus one, but I still do like them plus half a goal, uh, plus 125 or better. Sam, I have a I have a stat for you. And this stat has reigned in my mind for a long time. The last time these two teams met, it was at Brentford, to to be fair to United, 
but it was a 1-1 draw. Brentford outcreated United 3.2 expected goals to 0.6. They had 77 touches in United's penalty area. That is a Premier League record for a match that didn't involve a red card. That is insane. Wow. And we know that, but we know United's defense has improved, right? Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's going to be that bad again. But in any case, this should be a match, right? Where United says, you know what? We're the favorites and we should start to press Brentford because they have obviously struggled in terms of trying to build out of the back uh, more often. They're conceding the most high turnovers of anybody in the Premier League. And that is definitely a concern. But when Brentford wants to and they want to play direct, they're going to be able to punish United here. And in, what happened in that match against United is United was pressing with only their attackers. Their fullbacks didn't come up and aid the press. And Brentford just repeatedly over and over again was just doing outlet balls out to the fullback. And they consistently got 2v1s out wide and just sent in cross after cross after cross. Brentford has completed the most crosses of anybody in the Premier League into the penalty area. United is 15th defensively in defending crosses right now. That will give Brentford a big edge. Not only that, Brentford scored a goal off a set piece. They obviously this season they've gotten a little bit a little bit of a slower start in terms of their set piece routines, but they've consistently been one of the best set piece teams in the Premier League. And they get their set piece taker Matthias Jensen back from injury for this game, which is massive for them because if you watch them the last few games, some of their set piece takers have not been doing a great job of delivering the right balls. United is 17th in XG per set piece allowed. They've been doing a terrible job of defending him. So I think this is a great spot here, Brentford. I love your I love your selection as well. I think we're going to see a lot of goals in this one. Um, some injury concerns for United as well in this one to keep keep on a lookout for. Uh, Garnacho, uh, Maynou uh, are both questionable for this match. Maserawi, Maguire, Shaw are all most likely going to miss it. So some injury concerns there for United if though all those guys don't play. Suddenly, you're without your starting right back, and then, you know, things become a little bit more difficult when you're trying to defend in wide areas. So, uh, I love Brentford here, one of my Super Bowls every year. And I'll leave you with this, Sam. Brentford has played United six times since being promoted to the Premier League. Total expected goals over those cumulative, over those six meetings, Brentford 9.2, United 8.3. But Brentford's only won one match. So... I love the bees here. We'll go plus a half uh, at plus 125. And if they continue to keep scoring inside the first two, two or three minutes, how about Brentford first 10 minutes money line nine to one as well, which could definitely could happen because what I find, what I found interesting, Sam, I read something that uh, Brentford treat kickoffs like set pieces. So they, they practice them and they routinely, they drill them into their players over and over again. And it's completely paid off four straight times to begin. They basically like to overload wide areas. They'll send long balls up there. And like you saw, Nathaniel Collins, like it's a set piece, will venture himself into the box and they'll try to find those headers. So uh, I love Brentford. You know, no surprise that they have a former gambler as their owner. They're trying to get every edge possible in this <laughs> game. But, um, but yes, both selections, I think, have a great shot of winning. And, you know, it's always good fading Ten Hog, which I did see, Sam, that if United blank against Brentford and West Ham in their next two matches, that uh, basically he's gone. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Is is the West Ham game at Old Trafford or is it away no, from home? No, it's at West Ham. So Yeah, he's, it, he's in a real tricky spot because I would not be surprised if they go to West Ham and lose. And it, you know, they they might well come unstuck against Brentford here on the weekend. So, yeah, yeah dodgy one. But knowing Ten Hag, he'll probably win them both, and then it'll guarantee him another six months in the job. So, and what's funny is they they also have Fenerbahce in the Europa League. Former Manchester United manager uh, Jose Mourinho can can put the final axe in him maybe on Thursday. That'd be pretty poetic if they decide to to axe him after that in Turkey. Um, all right. Let's move on to Fulham and Aston Villa. Fulham, big surprises so far in the Premier League. They're sitting at plus 145. Aston Villa sitting at plus 180 with the draw at plus 250. I think we're kind of in the same vein here, Sam, where... Listen, Fulham's been amazing so far. They've been really good. They've been really good at yep. Craven Cottage, but yep. should should they be a home favorite here against Aston Villa? I was 
gutted, to be honest, BJ, because I thought there was a chance that Villa might be favourites here. And yeah. I thought we might be able to sneak like a healthy looking 0.0 Asian line yeah. or maybe even some uh, a plus handicap, but it's very much gone the other way. So I think that opens a bit of value on Villa, something I'm re- not really tempted in, but I think others might be. So that Aston Villa price might shorten and it might present an opportunity on Fulham. And it's a Fulham team I'm very much on board with this season. That performance before the break at Manchester City is, is yeah, it's, it's really got me going, really. I love that performance. They could have won the game. They should have left the Etihad with something. And you know what? Adam Adama Traore probably should have scored a hat-trick or a brace, at least. Um, Fulham created so many chances against City after recovering the ball in transition. It will be Traore, Pereira. They, they were simply instructed just to sprint without the ball as fast as they could towards City's goals. Hit Jimenez too. So like launch a counter-attack and put City's back line under real pressure. And if they keep doing that, that's going to cause any Premier League side real problems. Traore is so fast, but the rest of them are, are no slouches either. And one thing I have to mention as well, by the way, is Raul Jimenez's back heel assist. If you remember it, um, I thought that was really, really impressive. If you've not seen it, um, go have a look. You can see the level of confidence he's playing at, the, the level of confidence that's just coursing through his veins right now. I'm such a big fan of his and I'm mindful I've brought him up on every podcast we've, mm-hmm. we've had in like the past four weeks. But yeah, go and watch that. Um, but yeah, looking at the value here, it's on Fulham. Fulham 0.0, it's on Villa, sorry. But Fulham 0.0 is at minus 120. It's not terrible, but I'd wait a bit, maybe to see if we can get any more juice of, out of that. I've Seen over 26.5 match shots is somewhat inviting at minus 110. Fulham home matches stand at 28, 32, 38 um, shots so far. And they've just registered 11 shots out there. Etty had in a game involving 31 attempts. So this thing could turn out to be quite end to end. And Fulham look blistering on the counter and in transition. And we know Villa can certainly play the host at their own game too. And what I like the look of is if you look at Fulham versus Man City is a matchup. City obviously play with quite a high line. They sometimes don't even play with a line. They play with all 10 outfield players in um, the opponent's half. And what Villa will do, they, they will employ a high line. So what Adama Traore, especially, and the likes of Alex Iwobi need is they need a bit of space in behind. And I think Fulham might just do exactly what they did at City get their players to sprint as fast as they can in transition and on the counter and really trouble that space in behind the Villa high line. So I also like Adama Traore, one shot on target at minus 120. He would have been thinking about those misses all international break and that Villa high line will resemble the kind of space he had a lot of joy with last week. So um, yeah, what have I ended up on? I've ended up on no bets. I'll give you about four there, but they're all lean. I would (laughs) just suggest to maybe bide your time and see where that full and price goes yeah I, i'm with you i think the value hit values here on villa but i i can't do it um the lines come down a little bit you know uh, fulham was plus 135 now we're sitting at plus 145 so we're getting closer to it being a, a straight pick them uh the problem with villa is is the champions league obligations that they have against bologna coming up this week and their home road splits are shockingly bad over the last since Unai Emery has gotten there. And Fulham, on the flip side of it, is so good at Craven Cottage and then away from home, historically under Silva, has been pretty, pretty bad. So with those home road splits, I, I really can't uh, I can't muster up to, to do it on Villa. But yeah, I, I may look at some of the some of the props there and the, the angles on Fulham because you're right. If Villa is going to play that high line. We know that Fulham has the transition ability to play off that high line and create a lot of chances off of it. All right, let's move on to another fun one that neither of us really have a bet on. It's Newcastle and Brighton. Newcastle is a minus 106 home favorite. Brighton sitting at plus 260 with the draw at plus 275. I mean, listen, this is (laughs) Brighton is playing. I don't want to use the word, but that high line they're playing against certain teams is suicidal. And I don't, I don't know how, 
I don't know how sustainable it is. I'll put it that way. We've seen Unai Emery try it over and over again. And there are certain instances against certain teams that will just absolutely punish it. Punish it. Newcastle is one of those teams that can really punish that high line. Now, the problem is, is Newcastle is also dealing with a lot of injuries. So it will be very dependent on who is actually available for Newcastle in this game. So um, for me, I, I have nothing on this, you know, over three at minus 120 was kind of interesting for a little bit, but I need I need Ishak to play because I, I think you'll agree, Sam, that this this Newcastle team without a striker just doesn't look just doesn't look good. Yeah, I've got one sentence in my notes in front of me and it's saying unwilling to back goals in a Newcastle game earlier in the week when we don't really know what we're working with up top. Is Isaac fit? Will Gordon lead the line? There's a big difference between those two possibilities. Newcastle have scored three goals in the four games since Isaac picked up a knock. He played in one of those games, but I know he was on um, some kind of pain medication for his toe. It's not ideal. Um, so, yeah, they've scored three goals in their last four. Uh, one of those games against League Two outfit AFC Wimbledon. So, you know, not exactly firing. Um across the front line and it's because Isaac's not around and it's because they don't have another fully fit striker Wilson's out too so yeah like you BJ I would love goals in this normally but I'm just yeah I'm just not so so I'll probably pass on this one all right let's move on to the final uh game of the 10 a.m eastern time window a relegation six-pointer. Southampton taking on Leicester. Southampton is a plus 130 home favorite. Leicester sitting at two to one with the draw at plus 250. I'm going to bet Southampton here. I like them drawing a bet at minus 140. And I know that the perception of them around most of the Premier League is that they are the worst team and that, that they can't seem to get things right under Russell Martin. But I think if we take what happened in the match against Ipswich... I think you'll see that Southampton under Russell Martin with their buildup can work against certain teams. Now, listen, his, his method's not sustainable for the Premier League. With how good teams are at pressing, it's never going to work against the elite teams, right? But against some of these teams against the in the bottom of the table, I think it has a decent chance of, of working. I mean, Southampton has the second best buildup completion percentage so far this season. Now, they can't do anything with it in the final third, but that match against Ipswich they did create 2.4 expected goals off of 11 shots. And if you look at what's funny enough, Sam, is these two teams have played the exact two same opponents in their last two matches, Arsenal and Bournemouth. Leicester conceded 6.5 expected goals against those two teams. Southampton conceded 3.1. So I sigh because, you know, backing Southampton right now is, uh, you know, very taboo uh, in terms of, you know, how – good they are um and you'll know this too is that last year in the championship uh lester hammered southampton in both meetings twice but yeah. yeah i do think that this lester defense is is quite terrible considering what they've done lately their offense has only created over one expected goal in one match this season so if you're looking for a chance to buy low on southampton i think this is potentially the spot and also, these are the two worst set-piece defenses in the Premier League. Southampton offensively is actually second in XG per set-piece, which I found kind of shocking when I was going through this. So I think you'll give them their at home. They have that set-piece advantage. I think they should be able to build up through there. I like draw no bet as the protection here instead of backing them on the on the money line. So I like Southampton draw no bet at minus 140, but I'm sure you're going to tell me that I'm I'm a little crazy. You are a little crazy, but that's <laughs> fine. Um, I don't think you'll be siding with Southampton drawing a bet too many times this season, no, but I can see not. why you're doing it here. Just for me, I, I just struggle to back Southampton right now to win a game or any variation of a positive home result. Maybe until they show me that they've, you know, can actually win a Premier League game, that would be a really nice start for me to want <laughs> to get on side with them. Um they have, well, you mentioned Leicester got joy against them last season in the championship, 5-0 and 4-1. Things have changed a little. Obviously, Maresca is no longer in charge 
in Leicester. For me, I've passed on this game, but my heart was saying goals over 2.75 around even money, but my head is is telling me to sit this one out as I'm just not overly convinced as to what we're going to get from either team. I think Southampton, well, we know what Southampton are going to do. They're going to play out from the back, keep the ball, and I think they have it in them to to do that successfully against this Leicester team at least once, maybe twice. They've not scored twice in a Premier League game yet this season. Leicester City have done so twice, 4-2 against Arsenal and 2-2 against Palace. Um, Yeah, so I think Southampton are going to be successful to to some degree, but I'm just not convinced either way. So I'm going to sit this one out, but I would lean towards goals. All right, let's move on to the 12.30 p.m. Eastern time kickoff 5 30 PM Eastern time in the UK Arsenal traveling to Bournemouth Arsenal is a minus 150 road favorite Bournemouth as a four to one home underdog with the draw at plus 290. This line's come down a little bit. Arsenal was at minus 175 and then some injury concerns have popped up for Arsenal. Uh, and I think that Sam, the way to play this is to watch these injury concerns. Arsenal has Shakhtar in the Champions League coming up. And then on the weekend, they have a huge match against Liverpool. So as of right now, Odegaard is out. Ben White is questionable. Jurian Timber is questionable. Kai Havertz is questionable. Saka is questionable. Party is most likely going to miss. Gabriel Martinelli is most likely going to miss. So my goodness, I mean, entire Arsenal's almost entire team is potentially maybe going to miss this match. And if that's the case, you have to bet Bournemouth in this spot. Yeah, that's fair enough. This is another game, third on the balance that I'm, I'm actually going to pass. Um, if you take the top six Premier League sides out of the equation this season, Brighton and Bournemouth lead the way with touches in the opposition penalty area, which I'd love as an Iriola enthusiast, and I'm not surprised that. And they're going to need a few more of them on the weekend to get anything from this Arsenal game, but that's really not going to be easy. Um, But surprisingly, at this stage of the season, it's Bournemouth which holds the unwanted record of losing to nil more than any other team. (laughs) Um, So I suppose the question is, can Arsenal record like another infamous shutout on the road and, and keep the cherries at bay? I'm not too sure if they will. So I'm not convinced that that minus 152 price around Arsenal's neck, especially now if you're telling me that, you know, like a third of their squad are questionable. Um, It's a price which I think people will look at and and include in their parlays and their accumulators, but it feels a bit trappy, uh, trappy to me. Um, but equally, I also wouldn't be overly surprised if Arsenal run out winners here, making the plus 0.75 Asian handicap on the hosts a little off-putting too. So again, it's a game which feels a bit trappy and I just really don't know what we're going to get, especially if Arsenal are missing a few. Yeah, I, I'll put it this way. It, the one guy that I would, out of that, is if Saka is out and he's not going to play in this game, I think you have to bet Bournemouth because if you've watched Arsenal, they are so dependent on Bukayo Saka and getting him the ball and having him create everything. Two assists and a goal against Southampton. Again, if him and Havertz are both out, I mean, even Timber and White being both out, they played Thomas Party at right back. Well, if then he, yeah. well, if he's out again, like it's like now we're down to Tomiyasu who's coming back from injury as well. So it's just like, it's very barren right now for Arsenal. So just, if I were playing this, I would keep up to date on those injuries. If, you know, I would say if, if Saka and Havertz are out, I would definitely bet Bournemouth in the spot because I don't think Arsenal has the attacking prowess to actually take advantage of it without those two guys. Um, let's move on to Sunday, 9 a.m. Eastern time kickoff. Wolves hosting Manchester City. Wolves is a 7-1 to home underdog. Manchester City sitting at minus 300 with the draw at plus 500. You know, I saw this game, Sam, and I saw the line, and I just kind of sighed because I was like, I would have loved to get Wolves maybe like at a plus two in this spot, but they didn't give us that. So I'm kind of in a limbo where I was kind of looking at some of the props in this game, and some of the Holland props are kind of interesting to me. Uh, Obviously, he's really good. We all know that, right? 
Um, is quite good. Yeah. He is quite good. <laughs> but what I found interesting when I was digging deeper into him, he's actually getting way more production this season than he has ever as a Manchester City uh, in a Manchester City shirt. 4.8 shots per 90 so far this season. 3.1 shots per 90 on target. That's double what he was averaging last season. So Wolves defensively, shocking how bad they were against Brentford. Just like simple stuff, like we've already mentioned, like simple crosses into the box. They conceded a goal with giving Ethan Pinnock just like a completely free header off of a set piece. Um, Pep will know that. He'll overload the middle. He'll get his wingers and isolate into 1v1 situations. And I think they're just going to send crosses into Holland. So there's two props I like for him. Mul- uh, multiple goals at plus 260 and then over three and a half shots on target at six to one. He's gone over three and a half shots on target against West Ham and against Brentford, two similarly bad defensive teams to Wolves, and then five shots on target against Arsenal when they had 10 men. So I think those props are a little bit short considering how like shockingly bad Wolves' defense has been. I know that they've completely underperformed defensively, but let's be honest, that positive regression is not going to come against the best offensive team in the Premier League. So that's the way I would look at this match. Uh, if you're somebody who's like, I don't know if I want to lay minus one and a half with City on the road in a spot where they have a Champions League match coming up in the midweek against Sparta Prague. So uh, if, if Holland's in there, I think that he's just, you know, it's I'm not, I'm not, you know, saying anything newsworthy here, but that he's probably going to score a couple goals. So that's how I look in this one. Do you see anything uh, in this match? Not really. Um, BJ, I'll I'll probably agree with you. Yeah, if I was to take a props, obviously Haaland go would be the way to go. Haaland brace. Um, Wolves are the only side to lose all of their home games in the Premier League. The club has never overseen four consecutive home defeats to begin a season. And now they welcome Manchester City on the weekend. So that does not look good. Um, City have actually conceded the first goal in three or four home games this season. But away from home, Guardiola's men are yet to concede the first goal. I, I, I don't really have anything here. But mm. if you see this game as... Obviously, lots of players coming back from international break. Wolves has just put in their worst performance of the season. If you see this as Gary O'Neill's had this Wolves team on the training pitch for the last two weeks, drilling, you know, loads of different types of information into them. They come here on the weekend as a wounded animal. If you think they can get a goal here at home, like a few teams have done against City this season, then maybe... City to win and both teams to score at plus one sixty could be a way in, but again, look, that's that's not my um, that's not my most favourite fancy of the weekend. That's that's definitely probably a little bit more than a lean, a little bit less than than a lean, should I say? Yeah, the the interesting part here for Wolves is I don't think they're going to sack Gary O'Neill. I think they're smarter than that. Um, but this match and then on the weekend they have Brighton, and then after that. The schedule gets pretty easy. They go Palace, Southampton, Fulham, Bournemouth, Everton, West Ham, Ipswich, and Leicester right up until Christmas. So I haven't seen what Wolves' price is to stay up right now in the futures market, but that may be something to look at uh, after they play both City and Brighton. If you can get that at a decent price, I know that their underlying metrics are, are quite terrible. They're a way more talented team than the three promoted teams that have came up. So I think you'll see them get back on track here. They've just had a really, really tough run in their schedule so far. So um, if you're looking to back Wolves, I think that is maybe a potentially way to play them uh, in the futures market. And let's move on to our final match of the weekend. We get a Monday night football. This is great. We love Monday night football. We Nottingham did. Forest taking on Crystal Palace. Nottingham Forest is sitting at plus 130. Palace sitting at 2-1 to one with the draw at plus 250. Kind of two similar teams, uh, if we're being honest. Uh, Nottingham Forest has definitely been way more impressive uh, than Crystal Palace so far this season, although I do think Palace will get better as the season goes along. I'm still a believer in Oliver Glossner. Um, so... I have I have nothing on this match. I was potentially looking to play an under, but that has been juiced uh, pretty heavily. So uh, I'm going to pass on that. But you, you do have something for this match. Yeah. So 
Only one Forest fixture has gone over 2.5 goals this season, and that goes some way to explaining why the bookmakers have set this as a 2.25 goal line, the lowest mm -hmm. in the division. Um, so I don't know if we should see too many goals. And I just think overall, looking at the international break, I think this is a concerning spot for Forest. If you consider those who might be missing uh, or jaded from the break, got Taiwo Awanyi, he was part of that Nigerian squad, which was somewhat held hostage at an airport in Libya mm. not too long ago. And elsewhere, um, Forrest's other number nine, Chris Wood, he's just played in Vanuatu, which is east of Australia, I think. It's yep. somewhere over yep. there. Somewhere out um, there. <laughs> Gibbs White's ankle injury picked up against Chelsea before the break. Might rule him out here. He's probably their best, most impactful player. And there's going to be no James Ward-Prowse in the midfield against Palace as he's suspended from jumping on that uh, runaway ball with his hands. So it's going to be a, a different looking Nottingham Forest team. And I've said it before, this this Palace side, that they're, they're, look, they're really, they really are looking for a result to kickstart their season. And if we are along the same kind of thinking as the bookmakers. If we think this will be a low-scoring game, then Palace might just edge it. They might not. It might be a draw. It might be nil-nil. So to get Palace on the plus 0 0.25 Asian handicap line, it's it's more of a lean than anything because I've, I've been really impressed with Forest. I'd probably rank them near enough to, to Fulham in terms of teams that have really surprised and impressed me this season that those two are probably right up there so more of a lean than anything but if we get a low scoring game then that plus line might just um do the job for palace for sure all right let's you know what sam i'm gonna kick it right back to you let's first get uh sam's bet from the championship uh and then i'll do my little jaunt around around europe okay yeah so we're heading to hull Hull versus okay. Sunderland over to 2.75 goes at minus 105. This was an over 2.5 line, but that's moved a little annoyingly. Um, whole season really kicked off away in Stoke at the end of September. They scored three goals there and they, they locked in their first victory. Score lines since and including that game have been 3-1, 4-1, 3-1, all wins, and then a 4-0 loss to Norwich before the international break. But even against Norwich, that wasn't from the want to try in. There were 16 whole shots in that game to Norwich's 19. There was accumulated XG of nearly six. And if you look in the uh, away dressing room here, Sunderland have been excellent in spells this season, but they have lost their last two away fixtures, conceding 1.89 XGA to Watford and also 1.79 XGA to Plymouth Argo. And that was Rooney's first win. So Sunderland, they'll be targeting all three points here, but in the back of their mind, they'll also know, know that they are a little susceptible on the road. And considering we need a, well, Hull needs a response post Norwich, post that 4-0 defeat, I think we can expect them to be amongst the goals as well. And this is a, a televised Sunday championship fixture. And I think they might just put on a show for the cameras in Yorkshire. So over 2.75 goals at minus 105. Funny story about Hull, Sam. I'll just say this really quick. Go on. When I was in England a long, long time ago, some guy asked me where I was from. And I said I was from Iowa. And he said, oh, it's like Hull. There's nothing there. And I had to have a chuckle because I was like, yeah, that's pretty, it's kind of true. <laughs> um, all right, I'll move on here. I'll take a little jaunt around Europe. Uh, let's start in Germany. Highest total on the board, Hoffenheim, Bochum, over three and a half goals at plus 105. Both of these teams are, well, they're horrible defensively. Hoffenheim is conceding 2.25 expected goals per 90. Bochum is at two and a half expected goals per 90 minutes allowed. Um, should be a very up and down type match. Hoffenheim does like to press high. They like to play in transition, which is exactly how Bochum likes to play. So, you know, typically when you get two teams that like to, to play very direct, it usually ends up actually more often than not in a high scoring type of fixture with both teams wanting to get out in the break. So I like over three and a half goals there. Juventus Lazio, both teams to score no at minus 115. Uh, Juventus still has not conceded a non penalty goal in, in Serie A season they are incredible defensively they're so awesome i it's funny i we we said this on the champions league podcast sam you know they were playing terrorism ball under allegri 
they're not really doing much different under Thiago Mata. Yes, they're they're controlling more possession and building out of the back, but defensively, you can kill the man, but you can't kill the idea. So Juventus conceding under half and an expected goal, uh, non penalty expected goal per ninety minutes. So both team to score, both team to score no at minus one fifteen. Uh, we shouldn't be setting that low, that aligned that low for these Juventus matches. And finally, Barcelona Sevilla over three and a half at plus one hundred five. Barcelona lost to Stegen in goal. Uh, under Hansi Flick, they are just playing incredible offensive uh, offensive football. The way they're able to overload the middle of the pitch, the way they're always able to find numerical advantages, it's it's incredible to watch. Um, but the the flip the downside of that is is because they have so many guys in the middle and they're committing so many guys in the attack there's just easy outlet balls out wide. And it's very easy to play against them, especially in counterattacking opportunities. Sevilla's a team that's very good at getting the ball in wide areas and sending crosses in. So these Barcelona totals, I think, are still a little bit too low given what they're doing under Hansi Flick. And Barcelona does have, funny enough, they have a huge match against Hansi Flick's old team, Bayern Munich, coming up in the Champions League uh, in the week. So that one should be a lot of fun. So that is my little jaunt around Europe. Now we'll move on to everybody's favorite segment, the underdog parlay. Not shocking, but Michael's got Everton two to one. They should always be in there and in nice. these type of situations. Um, but I'll kick it to you first. What's your favorite underdog play of the weekend? I might be losing my marbles a little bit, but I've gone for Adama Traore, anytime goal scorer, not known for his goal scoring capabilities, (laughs) I think is a nice way of putting it. And that shone through against Manchester City before the break. He could have had a hat trick there. Registered 1.29 XG from three attempts at the Etihad, but it feels like it was a bit more than that, to be honest. Um, Traore doesn't feature for Spain, so he's had a rested international break in that respect. And you can bet anything that he has been stewing on those misses for the past fortnight. Fulham will continue to do what they've been doing this season. And Traore is pivotal to that alongside Alex Iwobi. Commit bodies forward quickly under instruction for that forward quartet to get on their stakes, skates whenever the ball is turned over and to ruffle the feathers of their opposing retreating back line. So we should get chances. And that Villa high line offers the opportunity to attack that space, just like at Manchester City. So yeah, Adama Traore, anytime goal score at plus 375. And I'll go with Brentford, plus 350 against Manchester United, one of our favorite fixtures to bet every single year. Brentford has gone up against Manchester United six times since they've been promoted to the Premier League. They have cumulatively won the expected goals battle 9.2 to 8.3 over those six meetings, even though they have only won one match. And last time they faced United, they completely hammered them. 3.2 expected goals to 0.6 in a 1-1 draw. 77 touches in United's penalty area. Obviously, United's uh, defense has gotten better this season. The press has gotten better. But even if they decide to go man-to-man and try to press Brentford, Brentford is really, really good in getting guys into 1v1 situations against the opposing defenders, especially Brian and Buemo. If he is going to be playing in that half space role going up against Lissandra Martinez, I, I, it's a pretty easy bet that I think he's going to burn him one, a couple different times and get Brentford in those balls over the top because Brentford has the third best long ball completion percentage so far this season. So if Brentford decides to play direct, which I think they should, I think it gives him a great opportunity to pull off an upset against Manchester United. Let's move on to our favorite bets of the Premier League. Sam, what's your favorite bet this weekend? Both teams have scored over 2.5 goals in United v Brentford at minus 120. I don't expect Man United to make it four successive games where they fail to register a Premier League goal. We're entering into the realms of Eric Ten Hag potentially losing his job due to underperformance, so I'm expecting some kind of res- response. United have posted the biggest underperformance between goals scored, 5, and expected goals, 11.1 XG in the Premier League this season. So they've been unlucky, and it's something I think should revert soon. Against this Brentford side, who are instructed to get the ball forward and commit bodies like Fulham as quickly as possible and make runs from out of defence to outnumber opposition players and then flood the box with crosses. It just feels like a recipe for goals at Old Trafford. And it's worth noting that Brentford scored five goals against Wolves last time out, the same amount as United have managed all season. I'm going to go with Everton. Draw no bet against Ipswich. 
uh, I don't understand why Ipswich is a favorite here at home. They have the worst underlying metrics of anybody in the Premier League so far. Created only five expected goals, conceded 15. Both of those are dead last. And I'm not really sure what the plan is defensively for them because they were a high-pressing team in the championship, but now they're 17th in pass per defensive action, 18th in high turnovers, and they are conceding the most box entries of anybody in the Premier League. So when you play Everton, you have to be able to defend crosses and you have to be able to defend set pieces, which are two things that Ipswich cannot do. They are 12th in terms of defending crosses into their penalty area, and they conceded three goals as a result of crosses against West Ham, and they're 14th in XG per set piece allowed. And if they're going to try to build out of the back, which is what they want to do in these type of matches where they're the favorites and they're at home against Everton's high block that is turning teams over in dangerous areas at the third highest rate in the Premier League, this is just a nightmare matchup for them and one that I don't think they should be a favorite in. So I like Everton, draw no bet at plus 115. That'll do it for this episode of Wonder Goal. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for Sam for joining me here. Me and Michael will be back for the Champions League. That'll be in your feed on Monday morning for match week three. So thank you all for listening and we'll see you again next time.